Am I on? I'm on. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, uh, I wanted to start with this, this phrase, which I think Michael kind of gave a, a very good introduction to. Michael, if you want to carry on, that would be fantastic. Um, this, this was a phrase that came from a, a, a kind of point in our career when we didn't really think we'd be a, an architecture office. I mean, we finished studying um, in the middle of the last recession, uh, which is a really interesting time to, 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 to come out of college because the kind of normal routes you take, you know, go and get a job in London with uh, Norman Foster or Richard Rogers, for example, just weren't open. So we had to look for something else to do. Um, and we thought we'd carry on you know, with the kind of things we've been interested in at, at university. And we thought we were interested in architecture, but kind of interestingly, we weren't able to conceive of the idea of actually having an architectural office operating in the United Kingdom by a bunch of people who were under 50 um, at that time. This is sort of mid, early to mid-90s. So we began to look at lots of other avenues of, of a kind of architectural exploration, um, architectural production, ways in which you could make, of, make or think of architecture. And so that really meant um, installations, it meant objects, and it meant words as well, like slogans. Um, and this, this was a very powerful slogan for us, taste, not space. And what it meant to us was a kind of rejection of what we saw as the mainstream of architecture, which was incredibly sculptural, um, incredibly three-dimensional, but also kind of incredibly meaningless. Like, it was doing a lot of stuff, but you never quite knew why. The effect was, in, was, was really incredible, but you never knew why it wanted to work you over so much. So this, this phrase, taste not space, was saying, okay, well, what happens if we reverse this idea of architecture, uh, the, the area that architecture is interested in? What if we say it's about the surface, not about space? And this was really saying that the surface, to a, lot, to a large extent, is the place where a certain kind of meaning is located, where architecture kind of finds it impossible to be abstract. So if you, even if you look around here, you look at the kind of brick wall, which starts to tell you about the history of the building. It tells you something about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the faculty here kind of enjoying having a, a kind of a, a, an exposed brickwork wall, which tells you something about the culture of the place. Um, taste for us, was, was actually the moment where architecture got political. So if you think of us as an idea of architectural as political act, we ironically found it in the most ephemeral, most kind of shallow parts of architecture. We think taste is where architecture gets political because it's where things like class, value, social codes are kind of revealed. So if you think, um, you know, if you walk into somebody's, somebody's house, maybe someone you don't know, so, well, a distant relative, perhaps. Um, and, and you've you know, been to architecture school, you've been educated in the ways of the architect, and you kind of walk into this house and you see flock wallpaper, shag pile carpets, ceramic figurines, all of this kind of stuff. And your architecturally educated spine kind of shivers and you think, oh my God. And it's that shiver which we think is a kind of moment of architecture. It's not just about kind of good taste and bad taste, but it's about a recognition of taste making a kind of space, and a space which tells you about social codes, about um, individual personalities, expression of uh, all kinds of social ideas. So let me take you through a, a single piece of architecture in a little, uh, a little uh, historical uh, interlude called 2,000 Years of Nonstop Nostalgia. Um, and what it's really about is, is something which starts off as, as a vernacular, a real vernacular, like local materials turned into a, a building. This is a, a, a kind of simple uh, wooden framed building from, uh, from, from Germany. Um, and so this is like, you know, maybe 3,000 years ago, people were building this, 2,500 years ago, people were building like this. But the story uh, I'm going to tell is about the, the Saxons who were brought over um, by the Romans who invaded Britain. Um, and so here are the Romans coming over in their boats. The Romans weren't that interested really in Britain, so they brought a lot of mercenaries to you know, kind of control, control the territory. And these, these mercenaries were from, from Germany. 
And when they were in England, they began to build stuff like this, which wasn't a local British vernacular. So it's an amazing, to, amazing to think that, that even like 2,000 years ago, buildings like this weren't uh, a, a kind of normal, weren't natural. They were already nostalgic. So it's amazing to think like 2,000 years ago, people could be nostalgic. Um, they were also signs. They were also a way of architecture trying to make an idea of place. Nothing to do with geography, but a kind of cultural idea. So we see stuff like this. Here, you know, the, the wood's still very structural. It's infilled with wattle and daub. So moving on a bit in history, we get to the point where William the Conqueror invades Britain. And this is a, a, an incredibly organized military uh, occupation of, of the country. And it's done through the construction of castles. There are 70 castles built in 100 years. Maybe 100 castles built in 70 years, something like that. A lot of castles. This was the first, which is the White Tower in London. And what you see here is a massive stone military architecture. And what you see here in this kind of weird slide taken from a computer game is, is, is uh, a, a kind of split. So you see the, the castle here, then you see the architecture of the people here. So this is all kind of uh, hard, military hardware, the castle. This is all kind of uh, half-timbered architecture. So the same stuff that we saw here. So this is now kind of definitely the architecture of the people. So this is kind of Robin Hood time. So this is, this is Robin Hood, and this is the Sheriff of Nottingham, essentially. Uh, a little bit, we're jumping forward. So this is Elizabethan times, which is very important for Britain. This is the point where, where Britain splits with, uh, uh, um, with Rome, uh, uh, which is you know, kind of important. It's where Britain's sea power allows it to become independent, and very wealthy, and very powerful. So you can see here, this is a, this is a slide of the... Uh, Battle of the Armada, where the British defeated the Spanish. And what you see at this period is these amazing kinds of buildings. This is an Elizabethan manor house. So this is the same kind of construction, half timbering, but it's done with a kind of an intricacy and a kind of delicacy and a kind of bravado, which is quite incredible. So the way I like to look at this is it's sort of, it's like a military hardware spin-off. So this is like you know, the, the same kind of thing which happens in the fallout of the space race, for example. What you're seeing here is a demonstration of exactly the same skills which were giving Britain its ability to you know, uh, go its own way, become wealthy, and so on. So now, half-timbering is the architecture of the state, the architecture of power. Like really incredible kind of pop art extravagances. It's a long history. We're jumping a long way now. So now we're into the arts and crafts. So this is like after the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's where uh, people like William Morris and Ruskin uh, were kind of thinking about design in relation to society and industrialization. And one of the things they were interested in was a kind of revival of pre-industrial uh, ways of making objects, um, ways of building architecture. So here there's a revival of... Uh, of half timbering, but it's got a kind of different political edge now. It's a kind of proto-socialist, um, kind of slightly uh, bohemian uh, uh, kind of culture that it's being used in. So what's what's interesting here is you think every time that half timbering reoccurs in culture, it completely changes its meaning, who it's built by, what it's built for. This is now um, sort of 1920. So this is after the First World War. So it's massive suburban expansion. So the railways are allowing London to become you know, a, a, a huge uh, kind of uh, area. And what you see now is half timbering applied to the outside of buildings. So this is like little strips of wood. So this is where it's starting to stop. It's stopping being um, um, structural and becoming image. And if you go to, to Britain, you see like you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of these semi-detached houses in the suburbs of, of, of all British uh, um, cities. It's also here uh, used as an advert for um, the garden cities. Um, so here you have the, the, an image of an image of architecture. But it's also exported. So now it's kind of a kind of 
vernacular which, which exceeds any idea of geography. So this is Jimmy Stewart's house in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles. So you can see like totally on West Coast vernacular, like tiny windows, pitched roof, and so on. But this is because it's been, as a style, it's been, it's been published in magazines. So very fashionable magazines at the time, like Country Life, were having big spreads. So this is the equivalent, I guess, of, of wallpaper, for example, um, which was kind of promoting an image of architecture around the world, so it becomes fashionable. But it also coincides with other reinterpretations of historical myths. So this is Robin Hood, as seen by Hollywood in the 30s or 40s. Just more, more examples of um, uh, English suburbs where you can see a very reduced bit of half timbering applied. So this is kind of becoming more and more abstract. Like you don't need much to suggest this whole history of half timbering. And sometimes you get these amazing examples where someone's just decided to apply these, these pieces themselves. And I think what's most fabulous is you can see the, you can see the drain pipe there. So you get kind of a little bit of infrastructure, which is drawn into, the, uh, into the, 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 the dialogue with history. So each time you see this kind of thing, it's just like Robin Hood. Each time you, there's a new version of Robin Hood, it doesn't tell you anything about Robin Hood. It tells you much more about you know, us now. So it's, it's, it's like science fiction set in the future, but, uh, but designed to tell you about now. This is kind of history. It looks like history, but it actually tells you about the present. Sometimes it's very authentic construction. This is the Globe, which is a reconstruction of the uh, uh, Shakespearean theatre on the South Bank in London. But this stuff is so kind of, uh, 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 kind of cut free from geography, but also from any kind of fact, that it's now used as the road sign for historic buildings. So even though it has kind of periods where it exists, it's just generic history now symbolized by half timbering. And again, it becomes something which is seen all around the world in very different interpretations. Um, we thought we'd try and end that history. It had been going on long enough. So we thought we'd try and kind of finally finally nail it. So this is half timbering as absolutely pure communication. So if it's been used in all of these examples I've just showed as a kind of way of saying something kind of obliquely, here it could be something which you could say really directly. So this is a font. You could load it onto your computer. You could type your letters on it if you, if you, if you desired. Um, but it's saying here's a kind of architectural element, an architectural style, which becomes completely direct as a, an explicit, as a form of communication. And here's that font painted onto the wall of a gallery where it reads, well, it's, it's kind of hard to tell, but it's, there's a K, I, L, L. It's kill the modernist within as it goes around the back of it. So this is a mantra that we say every morning as we get into the fat office, kill the modernist within. So here it's obviously saying, well, you know, this is about communication. It's nothing structural. This is a drawing of some structure. It's just paint. You know, it's a couple of millimeters thick. Um, so it's a kind of, in a sense, it's, it's a conclusion of one take on a small strand of architectural history. So this is a very central idea to, to, to the work we do. That architecture is about communication. It's a kind of media in itself. Um, so something like this is a sculpture which is a reworking of uh, the, the famous phrase of Le Corbusier, a house is a machine for living in. So this is saying a house is actually information for living in. So that's why it's constructed out of the materials you, you make communication out of, like a neon sign, but made three-dimensional and kind of um, spatialized. And I suppose that's, 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 there's one way of looking at the whole history of architecture. The whole history of architecture isn't about designing buildings. It's about designing an image of buildings. Um, so if you think a very primitive architecture, which has a very strong relationship to landscape, or you think of those very first Egyptian columns, which are like kind of abstract sculptures of trees, 
we think of Roman architecture, which is a kind of picture of Greek architecture applied to new typologies. Or you think of modernism, for example, as well, which is a kind of an image of industrial architecture applied to typologies of house, villa, um, uh, gallery, and, and so on. So there's an idea that here that architecture is about the construction of an image of a building. So this very, uh, very small project in the east end of London is for uh, a house and an office. And um, that should be fairly obvious because it's got a kind of picture of a house on it and a picture of an office block on it too. So this is like a kind of cartoon. It's like a kind of billboard of the building itself. It's a kind of picture of what the building is, as well as being the building. Um, and what it tries to play with is, is a kind of obviousness, but then a kind of, then something else. So while it has this kind of straightforwardness, this is like a kind of South Park bit of cartoonism. Here the office is scaled down, so this is actually one floor here. This is the garden, so here's a tree, obviously. But when you start to see this thing in three dimensions, it has, let's say, much more complexity. The, the scale starts to change, so the, uh, the parapet becomes a piece of skyline, and you start to see it more like a, a three-dimensional stage set. And so it flips between different kinds of modes. So here it's super thin. You know, it looks like, a, looks like it is a billboard. But as you go around the corner, it becomes much more three-dimensional. Then inside, it's, uh, it's, it's different. It's, this is the space that's behind the billboard, the kind of mystery beyond the billboard. Um, so you can start to see all kinds of gaps which open up. So here's a sort of gantry, uh, which is behind one of those screens. This is the view from inside the uh, office block, um, where it's like, uh, like the bit where you get to the, the top of the Statue of Liberty's head and kind of look out of her hat. So the scale of the thing outside and the scale of the thing inside is different. And so this is a sort of relationship between the way the thing's used and the image that it constructs externally. But I think what's, what's probably important here is that what it's trying to do is, is invent a way of talking about a an architectural typology. So this kind of live-work unit, kind of, you know, a bit of office, a bit of, bit of living, never really has an architectural expression. It often inhabits kind of abandoned um, industrial units. Here, it's trying to become a very kind of civic object. It's trying to communicate to the city uh, what it is uh, uh, um, and what its status is within its landscape. But it's very much talking about it as a piece of architecture. So it's talking about itself as an image of other kinds of buildings. But I suppose there's another way of looking uh, at this idea of architecture and communication. Like, what can it actually achieve rather than just talking rhetorically about the nature of architecture? This is a project uh, which has kind of got a very strong social component in a suburb of, of Rotterdam, uh, which you can see here. This is the this is the town, this is the sort of satellite suburb, this is the center of Rotterdam, and it's kind of split off by the harbor. And this is the plan of the town, uh, which this part is where everyone lives, and this is actually a, a oil refinery, even though it looks like a piece of town planning. Um, it was uh, built in the um, 50s, so it's a classic post-war new town, which looks like this kind of thing, so you can see the refinery here, and you can see the kinds of architecture which was built at that era, sort of uh, optimistic uh, modernism of the Newtown's movement. Over history, uh, over time, that's been kind of filled in with much more suburban uh, elements. But it's left a very strange landscape, so you get these incredible kind of juxtapositions between, you, know, you can look at, you can see this kind of abundance of nature uh, and that's got things like wild highland cattle wandering around and incredible bird life and so on. But that's juxtaposed with this, like, super industrial skyline. It looks like Blade Runner, you know, when the, when the night falls and flames coming out of it and so on. Um, the 
yeah, so this is a, this is a very good view showing the sort of classic slab block Newtown planning. But like most Newtowns, it was never quite you know kind of built in the way that it was designed to. Like 30% of it, 40% of it, of what was originally planned, actually manifested, and it kind of suffers, I suppose, from uh, a, a lack of image. It looks like any other new town, almost anywhere in the world. So we were asked by a group called uh, WIMBY. Uh, WIMBY is an acronym which stands for uh, Welcome Into My Backyard, a kind of reversal of NIMBY, um, to, uh, initially to make a response to this, to this place. And what we began to look for was ways in which uh, other narratives, which kind of escaped this uh, depressing uh, uh, story of a new town running into a, a, a kind of um, economic and social blight. And what we began to see uh, was some really amazing little things, like this person here who jacked into the municipal power supply and attached a carriage lamp. And we saw in this some kind of idea that there was some, something else happening, another imaginary version of the same town, which existed kind of like a ghost, like a kind of Im an imaginary version which kind of haunted uh, every house, every street. So here, the front of a house dreaming, perhaps, of becoming a bucolic Dutch landscape. Or something like this, which is a kind of very standard front garden, which... I think we walked past, took a photograph of, and you know, carried on. It was only when we got back home that we began to look at it and see quite how incredible this was. Like, if you look at the surface here, you can see one kind of paving, another kind of paving, some grass, you know, this pond here. And through these, we began to read a kind of narrative, if you like, a kind of really complex story that was being told by all of this do-it-yourself activity. So things to do with shipping, um, things to do with you know, ideas of, of different types of housing, um, ideas about landscape. And we tried to turn this into a piece of architecture by drawing it in axonometric and with a black line. So this is a kind of exaggeration of the narrative that we'd seen um, in this uh, front garden. What was key to this project was was process. Um, it took a long, long time. And working with Wimby, we, we, we had incredibly extensive community participation. And so this was to find partners who would, might provide money or might, provide, uh, who might want to use facilities or might uh, uh, be involved in various kinds of ways. And the image which we used really to kind of kickstart the whole process was this frost fair, which is a, a kind of strong Dutch tradition. When the canals freeze, uh, a kind of big uh, event occurs on the ice. And so the kind of things which you couldn't do normally in the city begin to happen there. This kind of, this kind of moment of opportunity where all kinds of activities are put on there, little tents. Um, so this, this was an idea of a moment in time where something almost impossible could happen. So this was the kind of the optimistic idea <laughs> at the heart of this project, which kept us going for like, eight years through the process. Um, while, we, while this extensive public consultation was going on, we were also thinking about the kinds of things which we thought would be important to um, combine. Now, this was a project which didn't really have a brief at that moment, but it was about community facilities and how community facilities could combine in a landscape. We began to think about things which would be really important, you know, ways in which uh, landscape becomes, becomes fundamentally engaged with, a, with its, uh, with its uh, uh, users. So we started with, at the obvious place, the pet cemetery. Um, There's also a statement saying, well, actually, there's a certain kind of thing which exists slightly below the level of traditional master planning, um, which can be super significant in the way in which... Uh, um, uh, landscapes can be formed. We looked at ways in which the project might begin to address different scales. So this was looking at um, pigeon fanciers lofts. So pigeon fanciers, like people who do racing pigeons. and so on. I have no idea if that's something which happens in the US. but 
but, so, but so this is like a super local, super quirky activity, which is allied or grafted onto something which is much more public. This is a, you know, a gigantic sign uh, uh, addressing the highway that passes uh, close to the site. So the idea of process was also a, a kind of, uh, um, a, 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 let's say, kind of accelerated into an image of how construction might occur. This was a dream that we had that, that, that opportunities arise in the making of projects. Um, and one of the things that we were going to have was lots of mud. And we thought this would be a, a fantastic kind of, you know, two or three months where you could do things with mud, which you couldn't do anywhere else. This was the festival of mud, which combined land art with monster truck racing. And this was also kind of the heart of the project, about trying to bring together very diverse groups. And so that's, that's groups within the town, so, so let's say young and old, or immigrant and uh, indigenous, um, but also kind of suburban and metropolitan cultured and uh, uh, community. So that through this bringing together, this kind of agglomeration of various interests, you get a kind of synergy uh, between them. Suggestions of things like this, which is a, uh, what became known as the Hobby Hut, which was a kind of subsidized facility for um, uh, uh, local groups who were kind of just about to, 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 to um, uh, uh, get too big to run their operations out of a garage or their front room anymore and a piece of architecture which had the ambition to be as communicative uh, as something like this, you know, as kind of rich in the telling of cultural stories and history, but in the vernacular and within the budget of this kind of thing. Um, so I guess the idea was if you kind of flick between those enough, somehow something would emerge. And what we began to look at was this idea of you know, how you might take something which was an incredibly generic structure but start to make it say something very specific about the community and the landscape and the history of this place. And the obvious place to start with a project like this is a big cartoon image. Like, as I, say, as I was saying, there's no, um, there was no uh, budget, there was no real site, so we needed to gather together all of the, uh, part or the participants that we would need to manifest this project, which Wimby had uh, designated as so important to the future of the town. So an image like this was used essentially to convince people that there was something that was going to happen. A model, again, super explicit. But also events, which were kind of testings of the whole premise of, you know, was this agglomeration of local community programs, something which would actually congeal in, into anything which would work or anything which was of value. So for a number of summers, uh, a, a series of uh, uh, festivals uh, uh, took place where ideas about the kind of architecture were being tested, so the stage here, but also the program. So here you have some, um, uh, some kind of Dutch formation dancing, which was allied, uh, you know, the, the, the following act would be some Dutch R&B, there would be a donkey ride for children, there'd be all kinds of activities which kind of cut across social groupings. And it eventually congealed into a project. There's a, there's a highway along here, so we began to build an artificial hill, which is a novelty in Holland, a hill, obviously. But the hill functions both as a piece of kind of uh, nature, this is where the Highland cattle would roam, also as a kind of a, a noise bond uh, to the highway. Um, there's a lake that's dug, so this is about draining the water from the, uh, the very sodden uh, landscape of, of, of Holland. Um, but all of these things which were done, you know, so this, this is also about cleaning um, soil. This is about uh, 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 um, a reclamation of um, contaminated land. So these kinds of things which come out of um, I guess uh, ways in which funding could be brought into the project also became design opportunities. So this piece of infrastructure becomes sculpted into a, a kind of art piece. So this lake is in the shape, geographically, of Holland. Um, the whole thing centers around a building called the Villa. And then there's a number of other pieces. A children's playground here. 
uh, what's known as the festival ground, a big flat piece of grass, uh, a sort of overscale patio here with hobby huts and sports facilities dotted uh, along it, and then the pet cemetery and an arboretum. So a very strange agglomeration of activities, which are just really whoever could stick the distance, not have a tantrum, or uh, be particularly pleased to be involved. So here's a view from one side of the lake, uh, which might well be Belgium, um, towards the villa. And what we have with the, the villa is uh, essentially a very generic kind of building, like super cheap, this is sort of light industrial kind of structure, but which is overlaid with something which is incredibly specific to this location and I think to this time as well. And the story that the building tells is like a kind of, it's like a super graphic uh, communication device, essentially. And what it's saying is something about the skyline of the refinery. It's talking about the relationship of the industrial to the natural, so this sort of tree canopy entrance. This is actually made from polystyrene, sprayed with uh, uh, polyurethane, with a gold uh, uh, um, uh, coloring to it. And at the back, where it faces the park, it begins to talk about the uh, uh, kind of structure of all of the industry that's in the, in the, the, the location, interpretations of nature and housing. So this one line that's cut into this wooden cladding is a kind of device which is trying to tell a very explicit story. And it's, it kind of sits like a sheath around a very ordinary building. Although that is interrupted at one point with a small forest that's cut into it. So this is a cafe uh, whose doors can open up. So this, these kind of fake trees suddenly become part of the real uh, natural landscape around. So inside, you have this kind of basic industrial shell which starts to look out of these screens which, uh, which, which, which kind of fall um, behind the glazing. So you start to get a much more intricate relationship between the inside of the building and the exterior. So a very simple plan. This is the entrance here. A big communal hall here. A smaller cafe here. Simple section. So it's big, big hall, small cafe. At lobby. And then what happens inside it is all kinds of events. So this, this range from this kind of thing, people having a very good time, I think, <laughs> um, to this kind of thing. This is a, a Moroccan wedding, um, to uh, circumcision parties, but also some things which are kind of, uh, 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 let's say, less. Uh, um, Less, they have less local flavor. Um, uh, so you know, education or institutions use the building. Um, corporations use the building. So it starts to bring together very disparate groups. Beautiful, huh? And in the landscape around it, there's all these, these um, uh, pieces of furniture, small pieces of architecture. So here's a hobby hut. Um, is used by a, a group of people who make model boats. This is inside their hobby hut. And they've made this very beautiful uh, barge enclosure for their fluorescent lights. Elements like this, which is a kind of a little bridge which takes the children to the, to the playground, and which they're infilling with wattle and daub, this uh, steel structure. And elements like this, which are kind of overscaling of, let's say, uh, a kind of domestic um, architecture or domestic pieces of design. So this sort of uh, uh, pattern which you might find in wallpaper becomes repeated as an overscale piece of civic uh, communication. This is, this is pointing the way to the arboretum, by the way. That's why it's in the, the shape of a tree. And other objects. So here we have something which is talking about both uh, the, the industrial and the natural. So here we have a log which has been sliced by this abstract piece of super pink 
that kind of old bubblegum uh, colored uh, uh, insertion. And elements like this, where it's using text very directly to communicate. So a lot of this is about how architecture works and how, what people understand when they look at architecture. And that way we could think of architecture as a set of codes. Um, so in this project, for example, we're looking at how applying one code to another code begins to make something that's different from both of your original sources. So this is like, you know, perhaps the most boring kind of house you could possibly think of. Certainly if you're English, <laughs> this is the kind of, this is like from, from a railway model um, kit. This is like generic house. But over the top of this, we've applied something which is completely undomestic, so the camouflage pattern. And this is what might be happening inside as well. So what you have in this kind of overlaying of one thing with another is a kind of suggestive narrative. So of course, this is a kind of rhetorical project here. This is just a kind of experiment in what happens when you place one thing on top of another. But I think it's an important way of thinking about architecture. I'm going to show you a project which is about social housing in a, a, a town called Manchester, which is in the north of, north of England. And to think about it as a kind of a, a, a place where architectural codes are important, I'm going to start with this slide. This is a, when we went to visit a set of residents. Now, we were rehousing them. And so we were working with them from visiting them in their, in their houses where they lived at the time to working through the design process with them to delivering them in the end with their, their new homes. So it's a very unusual process for social housing, where normally in social housing you kind of get what you're given. But here we had 23, 24 people who were essentially acting almost like clients. And the first thing we thought was very important was to kind of get to know them. And so things like this, I think, were quite significant. This was the kind of place that they lived in. This is the kind of housing which was about to be knocked down. But this was the kind of architecture which they kind of aspired to. This was the kind of home which they almost thought that they lived in or thought that they wanted to live in. And we found when we went to visit them, these incredible interiors. So things like this, which are so rich in architectural coding that it kind of frazzles your, your mind. Like, you know, what on earth is this trying to say? This is kind of half timbering, but I don't know, kind of... Adobe, Hut, very hard to actually kind of process this. It's like your mind short circuits. Really ingenious things, you know, fish tank, bar. A kind of idea of, you know, grand stately home dining room, but squashed into a very small room. Now, these other kinds of things, which, which they, they kind of do make you laugh. Um, but we also think that they're they kind of make you laugh because that moment of laughter is a moment of recognition of something. Um, it's not kind of irony. It's not saying, ha, 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 this is like, you know, uh, my architectural education makes me so much more than any of this. For us, certainly, it's looking at this, looking at this kind of territory, which is the thing which allows us as architects to operate, we, you know, that, that gives us the material that we need in order to start to make something which is particularly appropriate for this location, um, this scenario, these people. Also interesting programmatically, like bedrooms become offices, the way in which teenagers start to inhabit houses, so you get these kind of very complex familial relationships expressed through you know, pieces of cardboard. You know, so spatially, this is telling you something about a kind of very complex psychology of, of, uh, of the space of the family. And we began to explore with, with them kind of relationships, you know, how, where do you put the dining table? Is it in the kitchen, or is it in the dining room, or is it in something which is in between? About moments which could be significant, so, you know, um, uh, the moment of arrival at the house, the way in which they all uh, uh, join up as a terrace, uh, the way in which windows might be handled. And also important is the idea, uh, is, is, is its, is its um, context. So this is a, a new master plan their original homes were being demolished in order to make way for all of this stuff here. So new bits of water, uh, large apartment buildings. This is kind of new metropolitan living which was being manifested. But these guys, and these guys have been offered you know, to be uh, 
pepper potted, as they call it, around to, to, to kind of sprinkle social housing amongst, um, amongst the private developments. But these guys have said, no. One, we don't want to live in a flat. Um, this very English idea of a house being you know, an Englishman's house is his castle is a, is a, is a common phrase. Um, but also they wanted to stay together. Even though they didn't like each other very much, they spent um, 20 or 30 years bickering. Um, and they couldn't bear to not bicker, I suppose. <laughs> um, and so there was an idea of, they, you know, an idea of traditional housing. But there was also an idea of this thing becoming a little enclave unto itself which kind of affects the plan, really. So there's a kind of wall which, which uh, ties them all together. Um, they're, in a sense, very traditional houses. Um, we were told, first of all, that, that houses were, had to be two, two stories. Um, you know, it was a very fixed cultural idea of what a house was, which we thought was interesting, especially in the context of, of, of lots of metropolitan, kind of uh, 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 progressive uh, kinds of architecture. But, you know, it was there something that you could do with the traditional idea of a house? What we began to look at was a kind of uh, 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 this enclosing wall of this block becoming something which was super expressive. And something which could potentially take on this idea of do it yourself. It could become something like a, like a kind of pinboard. It could become additive. And what you see behind that is something which is much simpler. So what the facade is also doing is making the buildings taller than they should be. So these are two-story buildings on the whole. They're surrounded by six, seven, eight stories. Um, so this is a little bit like a, a puffer fish, which you know, under threat makes itself bigger than it actually is. So the facade here is, is kind of operating as a mediator of scale, but also a mediator of uh, 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 different types of community. It's kind of traditional in one sense, like it's a brick house. Um, there's traditional elements in terms of brick patterning, in terms of elements like this. But the way in which they've been scaled and the way they've been put together has a lot more in common with, let's say, more avant-garde techniques of juxtaposition, of overlay, of rescaling, and so on. So it's a kind of mixture. It's kind of looking two ways at the same time. It's one looking at a certain cultural idea of, of domesticity, but it's using that language in a completely inappropriate um, way. So you can see the context. These, these are some of the very early mills from the Industrial Revolution, which is partly what this brick is mirroring. But you can also see other ideas of what social housing should be like. So here the facade is a kind of mediator between different kinds of uh, um, uh, coded taste, if you like. This is Terry. And this Terry's dog survived the whole ordeal. <laughs> um, so you can probably see that a lot of what we do actually involves copying stuff. Um, rather than trying to endlessly come up with things which we've never seen before. It starts with stuff we've seen before many, many times. But what we're interested in doing through copying is to make something um, which performs differently. So it's not about something you've never seen before. It's about, some, it's about copying an image which then, through some kind of transformation, tells you something different. Something like this. This is a, the design for a stool. Um, so it looks like a piece of Greek statuary, but it's actually <laughs> cast out of foam. So when you sit on it, you know, this is Hercules, by the way. His kind of nose deforms, and his neck is incredibly comfortable, very accommodating. So here, it's the transformation of the material that's, that, that changes both the performance you know, of this thing. You, you expect, you understand, you think you understand. You can use it in a different way, but also its meaning. So something which represents, let's say, a certain kind of cultural certainty um, suddenly becomes deformed when you sit on it. Hercules bulges in kind of ways that you never thought Hercules would bulge. Um, or in projects like this, this is a, a series of objects which are tributes to fantastic 
design. So this is one of the original uh, Jonathan Ive IMAX, but made out of clay. From a lessy uh, coffee pot, but made out of clay. And this is, I think, my favorite, which is the uh, Philip Stark Juicy Salif, you know, the, uh, the kind of classic icon of design. If you go to a designer kind of homeware shop, you'll see one of these. It's the lemon squeezer. Um, but again, made out of clay really badly by me. Um, and what's happening here is, is the transformation of you know, the idea of the object through both the material but also the way in which it's made. The complete amateurism can be a kind of cultural activity, if you like. Um, so the way in which you copy stuff and, the, and uh, both the transformations you put it through materially or uh, in terms of um, how you construct it. This is a project for a, an art school in a place called Boxtel, which is in the south of Holland. And it's a very beautiful town. It's got a cathedral and a castle um, and some you know, very quaint old architecture. This is a shot of the existing school. We were, we were kind of brought in to renovate um, the school, which actually had most of its accommodation, um, but it just didn't quite make sense. And the school that had been built, part of, the, part of the school was 19th century, then there'd been an addition in the 1950s, something in the 60s, something in the 70s, something in the 80s, and then some porter cabins, which I think is pretty much the model for every educational uh, establishment across the world. It's only en it ends up in porter cabins. But anyway, this was the main entrance. So this is kind of the famous school. We got very lost when we tried to find it in the first place. Nobody knew where it was. And even when we got there, we couldn't tell we were there. There was no entry sign, um, you know, a, a gate with an incredibly long passageway with no, nothing to tell you you'd arrived at this very august institution. And its relationship between the cathedral and the castle, it's right slap in the middle of it. And there's a big parade, a religious parade every year, which goes past the front of the school. Now, as I was saying, like, really our job here was to demolish stuff rather than build stuff. And to demolish stuff in a way which kind of activated lots of relationships, um, which performed kind of education, it kind of transformed the education environment into something which was much more engaging, much more vibrant, uh, much more exciting. Um, and made much more sense in a kind of modern idea of education as opposed to you know, something which is 30 or 40 years old. So this was about you know, making connections between this room and that room, making uh, physical connections or visual connections, sometimes changing uses and so on. So this blue stuff is all of the public space that we're trying to create. But this idea of demolition as an architectural act kind of was, was interesting. And we started to think about this image. This is a... This is a drawing that, that uh, John Soane showed to the Bank of England when he was presenting them with his design for the Bank of England. And this is the Bank of England in ruins. This is an amazing idea, right? To go to your client and say, here's, here's my design for your project in ruins. And we also like this, this image, which is by an artist called Patrick Coalfield, um, which is a kind of cartoon version of ruins. Uh, these also were interesting, because, I suppose, because of these sit back, these kinds of, these kinds of uh, historical precedent. And also because of their complete difference to this kind of architecture. Um, the place is called St. Lucas, and we also, the, the, the site's history was that it was a monastery, um, which we thought was interesting. We also, uh, on our first visit there, walked into the workshops where there's kind of people working on very dangerous um, lathes and all kinds of mechanical equipment. We walked in there, and everyone looked like Marilyn Manson. It was a very weird site. So we began to think of this idea of a kind of pop gothic, a kind of way of a way of referencing both its history as a site, its context in relation to the castle and the cathedral, but also this sort of, this kind of Marilyn Manson-esque uh, 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 style that the students were, were sporting. So we began to look at 
this amazing book that we've got, which is called Architecture Drawings. And it just is architecture drawings, no text whatsoever. So this kind of complete divorce from any kind of knowledge about what you're looking at. So we began to copy this stuff. You can see us here trying to make ruined bits of Gothic and how that's beginning to transform into a sort of stylized, much more graphic version of it. You see it in models, for example. And then working at a design school is, is really hard because everybody thinks they've got a great idea. So you would arrive and everyone would come up to you with sketches and kind of pull you aside and tell you how rubbish your work was and how it would be much better if you did what they were suggesting. But someone suggested that we should look at this guy, which is a, a, a Belgian monk architect called Dom van der Laan. You can see him here in his like, monk's habit with his like, construction drawings, <laughs> which is a, certainly a unique selling point. Um, and, we, and most of the architecture does, for us anyway, is kind of pretty tedious. But we found this, this stuff, which was kind of these amazing patterns. So we thought, okay, well, we'll take this suggestion that someone's palmed off on us and we'll apply it. And so this is the kind of, this is the pattern that was applied to existing parts of the building. So we're seeing here is a kind of development of a new element applied, built around the existing architecture. Um, patterns applied to the surface of existing, of existing architecture. So kind of ways of modifying what's already there. And that modification is really to do with how it works, like how do you organize it, so wayfinding and legibility and so on. But that's achieved with something which is kind of uh, on the surface, you know, not really designed, it's not a sign in the traditional sense. So really there are a whole series of screens, you can see here in this drawing here, a kind of, a kind of gothic screen that's, that's, that sits in front of an existing piece of architecture. We found this amazing company um, who cast concrete, and they're like amazing at casting concrete. And this is at the factory, um, you can see the kind of what they've done. Interestingly, this guy looks like he's dressed like a monk, right? <laughs> but there's amazing shots here, a piece of gothic ruin being carried on a crane being lowered into place. So what this kind of newly constructed ruin does is modify the way in which you use the space. But it also begins to tie together a whole series of disparate um, pieces of architecture into something which has some kind of cohesion. And the manipulations here of kind of, uh, of flatness and depth, things being out of register, are ways of reinterpreting the kind of language which we were copying and stealing in the first place. So in a sense, what we're saying is, you know, it's not what you steal, it's the way that you steal it. And at various parts of the building, the kind of language changes. So there's a consistency of material, but it becomes much more restrained at some points. And the same themes occur inside. And a lot of the time it was a very simple, simple uh, changes to the addition of a piece of pattern to uh, uh, um, a kind of existing uh, uh, refectory, changes in floor pattern, um, which were all to do with kind of making places more, more legible, more visible, defining the identity of spaces and so on. So while we're kind of copying stuff, we're also interested in how you then put the things you copy together. So kind of in the act of assembling, really, like how you might combine this collection of things from various sources into something um, which operates in a new way. This is a pro project called Bathroom Suite, which is actually copying the same thing twice, putting them together into one object. This was, an, this was a a kind of strange project. It was uh, for an exhibition which was about British celebrities. And this was a bathroom which was supposed to be for um, David Beckham and Posh Spice. And uh, this, was, uh, this was kind of at the height of their romance. Um, of course, the height of their romance is a kind of continuous thing. Um, 
but this was like the first flash of their romance. So this was, uh, the, the, the premise of this was to take something as boring as, as plumbing and turn it into the most sort of fantastical uh, 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 devotion. So it's yeah, a combination of like plumbing and the Taj Mahal, essentially. Um, this is a bathroom for two people who are so inseparable that they cannot ever spend time apart. So um, you see here they share the sink, they share the bath, they share the shower. And what's kind of nice is when you put these things together, they start to make heart shapes, especially the bath. The shower is a piece of planning, which, which is like a Welsh love spoon, which are these things which traditionally Welsh men would carve these kind of swirling bits of wood to give as a gift to, their, uh, to, 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 to the woman that they were wooing. Um, and we thought here it would be very nice if uh, plumbing started to express the same kind of romantic intention. But of course, there's something horrific about the whole idea, right? And it gets worse when you look at it close up. It gets very organic, let's say. Um, so here is the kind of, it's the kind of double, doubling, um, or the kind of, let's say, three-quarter and three-quarter of, of objects, which kind of come together to create a new meaning. So here function, you know, the functionality of the bathroom starts to tell a narrative, which has nothing to do with hygiene or cleanliness, which is to do with, you know, a cultural idea. Um, so I think the last project I'm going to show you is uh, uh, a debut for this one, which is it's about to be uh, shown as part of the Rotterdam um, Architecture Biennale uh, next week. Um, and it's a project for a very particular location in, in Rotterdam, which is just here. So just to describe it, this is, uh, this is the river. There's a big road here. There's a big railway line here. There's a very kind of depressed... Uh, neighborhood here, and there's a gigantic mosque being constructed here, um, which is a kind of contentious issue in um, in, in Rotterdam, uh, uh, both the scale of it, but also the fact that it's a, a kind of symbol of, let's say, Rotterdam's changing demographic, um, which is a very kind of controversial issue. Now, what we're working on is something which combines some very ordinary local functions, but in a way which addresses a kind of a larger concern. So we're trying to put together um, things like a, a primary school, a nursery school, um, um, some social housing, um, some local facilities, like a library, for example, small retail, small shop. Um, but in this context where you have a local neighborhood here, whose urban plan has been completely obliterated by the railway, the highway, um, and the, the scale which has been introduced into this site of the mosque. So you can see the difference between the mosque and the, the local neighborhood. But also big box retail, which exists on the other side of the railway tracks, next to the water uh, front, and a very large um, soccer stadium um, that's nearby as well. So what we're looking at here is a kind of way of combining very everyday activities, but in a way which starts to make a, a kind of much grander, much bigger expression, something which begins to address the city, but also addresses the kind of collapse of the urban fabric at this point. Something also which is a kind of counterpoint to the explicit um, and expressive architecture of the mosque. And so this is how it begins to combine stuff. This is the kind of assemblage, I suppose, of program in this case. So we have different kinds of housing. Um, we have primary school. We have uh, daycare and, and uh, kindergarten, retail and cafe, and then some kind of undefined, as yet unspecified, public function, which are all drawn together. So each of these things are very viable programs on their own, um, but in terms of their urban impacts, are kind of minimal. So the idea here is when you bring them together, they have a much stronger presence. But they also have something which, in the way that they're brought together, 
which is a kind of counterpoint to the architecture of the mosque. So here is a sort of secular expressiveness um, of these kind of socially um, admirable functions. So while the building is an assemblage of different kinds of program, it has a very singular form. It's got this circular plan, a kind of drum, um, which from the exterior has a very strong graphic image, which changes as you go round the building. So it's sitting in a, in a park, so it addresses um, its context in all directions to the building, which doesn't have a front or a back. It's got front all the way around. And what it's, what it's starting to do is to reference um, parts of the landscape or parts of the activities which it contains um, in this facade. So you see here something which refers to the, uh, the uh, language of the infrastructure, the engineering, um, which, which is very close by on the site. And then things which refer to the kind of natural environment of the park which surrounds it too. But inside, it's kind of much more chopped up. So you can see here its relationship to the park, its relationship to the mosque, its relationship to the railway, and its circular plan. Inside, it starts to amalgamate these things in a very uh, uh, a kind of complex way. So it has a kind of simplicity, almost kind of dumbness in its, in its round plan. But in the way that it starts to combine you know, daycare and housing, it actually becomes, let's say, more of a kind of Baroque plan. So when we're drawing this, we're looking at uh, um, uh, you know, a Borromini plan, for example, and the way in which different spaces might begin to relate to each other. Here it's different programs. So you have, um, on the first floor, a piece of school and uh, uh, the core up to the housing. The building split with an off-center um, atrium into school and housing. I'm working all the way up to the top of the building, which becomes the playground for the school. So a view like this that becomes a kind of fantasy space uh, where you have this amazing view out over the river and across the whole of the city. So what this is really talking about is, I suppose, um, a single image which contains within it uh, a whole load of uh, diverse activities, but also diverse kinds of architecture. So that when it's flipping between things like this, which kind of looks like a, a, a kind of a box full of, uh, I don't know, like children's kind of um, uh, uh, play blocks, right? These sort of cartoon houses to when it becomes a smooth surface. There's a kind of variety of ways in which the volume of the architecture uh, 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 is formed. So this idea of the agglomeration, um, the way in which stuff is stuck together, becomes quite significant. Uh, right, well, I've got a final closing statement. Um, and essentially, the, the kind of work that we do, really, is, is in, a, in a strange way related to our name, although the name didn't come about because of this reason. But there's something to do, something to do with, I, I suppose, the consumption, consumption of image and consumption of architecture, um, consumption of, of uh, culture. Um, and this idea of consumption, you know, if you consume too much, you get fat. So in a sense, you know, our, our experiment is what happens if if architecture consumes more than it should, um, and things that it shouldn't as well. So looking outside of traditional architectural canon, um, ways of operating, techniques, as well as references. So we know what happens if you eat too much food, you know, what happens to your body, but I guess the idea is like, what, what happens to architecture? You know, what new shapes does it form? What new abilities does it gain? Or indeed, what new disabilities does it gain? So, thank you very much.
But it relies on, it kind of works within a certain visual <coughs> ground. Um, and the amount of intricacy in which something can bear is all to do with composition. Um, so although it's kind of aiming, say, cultural or social, it, it, does, yeah, it, it is a kind of form that has a formal quality. Isn't, isn't that like 
matching that, that oh. high and low, good and bad. It's actually that you can draw from a whole variety of different taste cultures um, without having kind of judgment. Obviously, I know, I mean, even even um, that in itself is very difficult. Personal, is that just that that, that kind of suspension of judgment? But I think it is saying there's no good, there's no bad, there's no up, there's no down. It's all a continuum of culture, and you can draw from various sources and amalgamate them as appropriate to a particular scenario. particularly interested in your um, house office that you showed us, and you said that the audience is the city. Uh, why was it so important to broadcast that message to the city? And then also, by focusing on the facade to promote this message rather than working from the inside out, how much did you sacrifice um, flexibility on the interior and the performance of the program? I think it was an interesting um, experiment, I think partly because of the typology. And the typology is Live work is kind of invisible. It doesn't really look like anything because it normally inhabits existing leftover pieces of architecture that have run out of their, their original use. So we thought you know, a kind of reinvention of that as a communicative psychology. We thought it was a kind of interesting experiment. So this is on the kind of city fringe. Location, the kind of place which is kind of sometimes blue, sometimes bust, um, where a lot of this sort of interstitial uh, art activity occurs, which is always the home of the kind of rough living, live work kind of, kind of situations. Um, in a sense, architecture it, it takes the total opposite of um, the programmatic you can, you can live in, you know, in any space, you can move in here tomorrow. You know, shower over there, it would be fine. It's a small cooker over there. So, in that sense, it was about how could, how could you invent something which communicates with this program? Very clearly to, to, to its name. Um, in terms of what happens behind it, actually quite the opposite. Like, if the outside does one thing, the inside does another. It really is a kind of separated thing. So the inside is a much more complex spatial, you know, in some senses, kind of abstract architectural space. But it kind of works because it is this sort of this thing beyond the world, you know, that kind of magical bit. Sometimes you have kind of B movements where you end up behind the uh, behind the building, behind the building, that kind of, that kind of uh, behind the curtain kind of bit. So there's no kind of it's not about one thing or the other. It's about kind of, um, well, in this case, how the burger can actually be the interior. They don't have to relate. The inside doesn't have to relate in the traditional way that it would in form by the function. It's um, kind of split. What happens in the inside? It talks about the outside, not in a, not in a literal way, but in a kind of more uh, figurative way.
Yeah, that's the kind of company you get when I have a big critic. Yeah. I mean, I have to see a model. Yeah. I have to see a section of the Plastic cover. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I guess in, the, in various situations it works differently. Sometimes it's well, literally south of the skin, but that down exactly to the end screen. Uh, it's, it's essentially detached from the building. So uh, there's some difference. There's the school project, the concrete block project. That's something which is totally freestanding. It doesn't perform in any way. Water out and the insulation in it. It's really kind of a modifier of the existing envelope of the architecture. So that separation allows it to sort of operate in a different way. So it's kind of pulling apart the envelope and gap that much, which I think is really significant. In other cases, it's, 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 it's a closer, more engaged relationship. So in the projects in Rotterdam, we build um, on various sides of the building. Part that becomes a society that kind of changes from being you know, essentially you know, an arcade to an you know, image. It becomes occupiable at certain points, something which is rapid at other points. So I think that the way in which that, that interface with the other performs is really different. Really like it's not just about it being, you know, it's not just that, it is also spatial. It is also um, something that becomes occupied as well. So the way in which that that line is drawn, where where is the meaning when it came to where is the envelope uh, uh, drawn? So I think that intersection changes a lot depending on the sex. Yeah. We are. So there's certain points where the, the, the kind of graphicness becomes becomes um, like almost so exaggerated that it becomes like, it doesn't just multiply the space, it actually is the space. So the kind of point where it actually becomes like the though the vast number of the video is then redesigned by by using this it becomes kind of spatial. The weather, I think, is really you know, a function of what's happening in the world. It's happening somewhere else. Yeah. 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 Quick question about I understand the concept of you plucking these ultra high shots on the pole for a But what inspired your color choices? I know there's things like, obviously, a big fan of the pink and the pink eye beams in the first project. And, like, where does that where does that come from? I tell you what, I love, I really, I really love pink, and I really love a certain kind of pink. And I really like it because, not because, not because it's like kind of garish and kind of kitsch, but almost because if, you, if, if, if the pink is not quite saturated enough, it seems to operate to me like grey. It becomes kind of neutral, especially if there's enough of it. It's a, it's, a, it's a weird phenomenon. So the more the certain kind of pink you have, the more neutral it becomes. I'm not sure it's because, I'm not sure what it is about it. I'm not sure it's, it's, um, it's, it's a pitch between being not too kitsch, but also not kind of tasteful. So it kind of falls between, uh, I suppose, like <laughs> kind of cultural ideas of, of color. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's the, that's pink. It's got, it's got this kind of weird, strong but neutral, like fast but slow, pop of color. Kind of, kind of all. It seems to be more things than that than just a color. Um, I noticed one point about when you were talking about like the Robin Hood. Thank you. 
And this idea is sort of horizontal, horizontalizing the culture. There's a sort of practice of an idea geography of class place. Let's say you wanted to build in a vernacular way, it would be combustible because of the way in which materials are manufactured and sourced and so on and so forth. It's kind of a complexity to the way in which architecture happens anyway that kind of means that certain ideas about architecture are almost impossible. And I think that's the same with, with image. Like image is sort of dislocated from, from place. It's almost, it's almost dislocated from the culture which has spawned the mass now of, 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 of imagery. Um, it's kind of floating around. And, um, what it seems also that there's this sort of, a kind of a full start in terms of the development of architectural styles beyond, beyond modernism stylistically it's almost as though there's nowhere else to go um, so it's kind of late modernism um, changes to the shape of the plan but it's stylistically I mean, it's pretty consistent with it, sort of abstract So I think then the way in which you operate with a, with a whole host of animal styles, so rather than trying to be authentic, trying to find an authentic expression of an age stylistically, is to say, well, what's more interesting is not the style, but the cultural idea of the style, the idea of the text, why this thing means this thing to that person, something else to somebody else. Um, you know, those things which on the surface of it seem the kind of most inauthentic elements of architecture, which actually offer you know, a, a very um, a strong insight into the way in which not just architecture, but kind of culture performs. So, yeah, so I think in a sense, ironically, we found an idea of uh, a politically engaged architecture through you know, soft furnishings <laughs> and uh, Wallpaper swatches, so we kind of recognize that through this ephemeral of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, making it nice domestically, actually, there's something much bigger machinations behind it. And so, that using that language, there's a kind of exposure of the codification of art to the way which art actually performs um, in a much more straightforward way than it pretending to. A complete, uh, um, totalizing architectural idea of that is obviously something very